Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dylan Golbeck. I'm a biologist and uh, environmental professional. I work with the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society as a naturalist and researcher and uh, with our invasive plant program as our coordinator. Um, as a side note, I am going to be working to incorporate some language of animism in, in my presentation. Uh, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer has published work on this if you are interested in learning more. So what that means is you'll hear me use kin, kins, and ki throughout the webinar instead of it and its. Um, this can alter how we view and work with the environment. Um, I haven't been able to get rid of the waiting room yet, so it looks like we've still got a few more folks jumping in. Uh, we are really excited to share with you today our work at the Weasel Head and talk about invasive plants. Um, our invasive plant work at the Weasel Head is financially supported by the Alberta Conservation Association and through private donations. This fiscal support has been critical in supporting uh, our mechanical invasive plant removal and educational programs like this one. Uh, just a couple housekeeping notes to begin. I've muted everyone. Please keep yourself on mute throughout the talk to help make it a little bit easier for everyone to hear. Uh, feel free to have your video on or off, whatever you feel most comfortable with. If you find your internet connection isn't handling the Zoom presentation very well, you can try turning off your video to reduce bandwidth. That often works. If you're having trouble seeing or hearing anything while I'm talking, please feel free to use the participant reaction function um, or put a, a note in the chat there so I can see that. And my cats have decided to play with the loudest toys that are available. Uh, right now, they always know when presentations are going on. <laughs> All right. Um, today, we are going to be covering a very giant topic. Um, I know it's certainly one that I could talk for a very long time about, and I do consider myself Bit of a nature nerd and i'm sure many of you might uh, describe yourselves that way as well so if there's anything you are really interested in learning about um, attending a program or webinar on please share in the comments or email me uh, or email us at the weasel head um, i'll put that email in the chat um, and i also will be posting a few other links in the chat here about where you can sign up to receive our newsletter uh, our website if you want to learn more about memberships and volunteering a uh, link to some resources to continue your learning and a link to our donation page if you feel inclined to support our work beyond your efforts to learn more just by your presence here today. So thank you very much for joining us today and I'll stick that in the chat. about us and where we are. This is a satellite picture of Calgary and zoomed in to that little speck on the left there. That is the Weaselhead Glimmer Park area. We are the Weaselhead Glimmer Park Preservation Society. We are a friends of nonprofit group that formed in 1994 um, by a group of people who are very passionate about preserving the biodiversity and ecological health of the Weaselhead Natural Area, North and South Glimmer Parks. Now, a very big piece of supporting and protecting the environment is through providing opportunities to learn and connect with the land, a chance to become aware of the benefits and necessity of these spaces, as well as our connectivity with them. We run environmental education programs for all ages, and our school programs have some 4,000 school children and 400 adults come out every year. So we run school programs, weeding workshops, guided hikes, um, we host bio blitzes, park cleanup, uh, events and learning events, community meetups, um, citizen science, and uh, more research. So we've got a lot going on. Um, I've listed some of these on our PowerPoint here. If you have any questions about getting involved, um, again, post in the chat or email me. Um, we'd be really excited to hear from you. Now, protection of the land requires active stewardship, much like the stewardship of First Nations people through time. 
the active stewardship and preservation of this area by the first people into the present serves as an inspiration for the society's efforts now. I'm presenting today from the territory where the Bow River and the Elbow River meet, or Calgary, the English name for this area. And this area holds many names, including Mokinstis, the Blackfoot name for this area. This land is the traditional home of the Sutina Nation, the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Siksika, the Gayunai, the Pikani, the Iahi Nakoda, which includes the Bear Paw, Chiniki, and good Stony First Nations. This is also home to Métis Region 3. Now, I'm making this acknowledgement of the land and the people connected to this land today so that we can continue to bear witness to the truth and history of this land and together build a future that honors this and reminds us to guide our choices towards reconciliation. I want to begin this talk with this as our frame to create a mindset of gratitude, awareness, connection, and respect for this land. I want to acknowledge Kin's past and present inhabitants, all of us who live with this land and who honor and celebrate this territory, to create spaces where all of us are recognized and supported to live our fullest lives. We know this work starts with each of us making the commitment to listen, learn, and act as called upon by the communities that we live in and alongside. Protecting the land also requires an acknowledgement of the connection that humans are a part of the ecosystems we inhabit and play a very important role in building our relationship with the land. Land management is not a new practice, nor is conservation ecology, though the methods and paradigms used in both by current formalized institutions differ from those practiced by place-based cultures throughout human history. But all of these practices originate from the idea of belonging to the land, that our wellness is tied to the wellness of the land, or to protect what is often called ecosystem services in academia. Today, we're gonna go through the basics of invasive plants, what they are, why we should care, common management techniques, species to watch out for in your gardens and in our parks, our invasive plant program at the Weasel Head, and what actions you can take. And just a little disclaimer, uh, I always like to give biology, <laughs> biology likes to break the rules. So for everything that we say will function in one way, there is almost always an example of something that disregards that rule. So I just want to throw that out today. Um, in short, this presentation is a simpl simplification of the beautiful complexity of nature and the challenges of invasive plant management. Let's start with some definitions. Native species are species that have lived long enough in a region to co-evolve with the ecosystem and kin's habitat uh, inhabitants towards balance. Introduced species are relatively new to an area. They can be introduced on purpose or by accident. Invasive species are a particular type of introduced species. These are species that outcompete other species and can harm harm to the environment. But this story really begins with evolution and isolation. This diagram shows a model of how geographic speciation occurs. This is the formation of new species. Species have been moving around the world, catching rides on the wind and the water, hanging onto other species, carried far from their kin by the movement of the tectonic plates even. In disparate habitats, isolated from other populations, these species evolved via random genetic changes and the pressures of survival acting on those, resulting in new species. Each species evolves in a community with predators, prey, parasites, and support from their environment and neighbors. When a species in is introduced to a new habitat, oh, here we go. it does not have these relationships to help balance its presence in the ecosystem. Sometimes these introduced species are not very well adapted to their new environment, or they are more easily balanced and more relationships are formed with the existing species community. The ability for species to move into unoccupied niches and evolve is actually one of the reasons for the return of biodiversity after ecological collapse and mass extinction events throughout the history of life on Earth. So this is, this is not a bad trait, even though this is um, 
kind of at the root of talking about invasive plants. Now I wanna share a really fun side story for you to, that illustrates this. Uh, research indicates that some of the cold adapted tree families that now dominate the Northern hemisphere evolved from species that originally began in the tropics and evolved to survive droughts. Well, the drought uh, adaptations actually had the byproduct of making them better able to survive cold climates. Turns out the stressors of cold and drought are actually very similar. With these new drought adaptations, the trees spread north and then evolved the ability to produce high amounts of sugars in their cells as antifreeze. And many also then evolved the ability to drop their leaves. Now, the ability to drop their leaves was accidentally a great adaptation for drought conditions. So these ancestors of these northern trees made it back to the tropics again. This history of uh, the movement of trees really illustrates the story of movement of change and evolution in species through time. It illustrates the connectivity of the world. But that connectivity has only increased with globalization and the increased movement of people around the world and trade. Now, previously the movement of species to new regions was slow and in small amounts. The habitat that the species was introduced to had time to become familiar with the new species and build relationships, co-evolve for some time, and the introduced species actually evolved as well. Over time, often becoming a new subspecies of the one it first arrived as. The image you see here is actually uh, the shipping routes uh, throughout the world. Um, and you can see the areas, the lines where um, the areas where the lines all converge. And these are areas that are particularly prone to new species um, invading. Place-based cultures throughout history and presently hold stories, identity, and culture that are built with the land. Because of this connection to the land has always been integral to the survival of people, people have brought important plants with them during periods of movement throughout history. However, during the most intensive periods of colonization, the concentration and rate of movement skyrocketed. And Ideas that valued connection and responsible land management outside of production were suppressed at the time. The idea existed that deliberate introduction of useful plants to a country was an ideal to strive for. And I actually came across a quote recently that um, that I found very indicative or representative of that idea at the time. This is a quote from Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was the third US president. Um, the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. This is very different from the ideology we now hold about invasive plants. So the rate of introduced species was and is beyond the capacity for many ecosystems to respond and remain intact. So even though this movement of species has always occurred, now it's at a, a rate that it's and biologically hard to keep up with. So let's jump into a few mechanisms of dispersal or modes of spread. Um, there's a couple listed on the, on the PowerPoint here. Some others actually include packing materials, seeds eaten and distributed by animals or catching a ride on the fur of animals, seeds or viable fragments that are embedded in topsoil, mulch or fill, bulk seed packages that are contaminated, potting soil, the dumping of garden debris into compost, parks, ditches, and wild areas. Um, and as you can see on here, a number of um, modes related to shipping and movement. With ecosystems facing drastic change in multiple parameters, inundated with invasion from numerous introduced species at once and a massive seed load uh, of these introduced species, many ecosystems that historically could respond to change are now faced with a 
ecological collapse. In fact, invasive species are only second to the threat of habitat loss and degradation in our current extinction crisis in the Anthropocene or the age of humans. I've already talked a little bit about the impacts of invasive species, but let's, let's jump into it a little bit more. Historically, species were categorized and managed in policy and law as invasive species in response to their measurable harm to human health and the economy. This has expanded to include impacts on the environment more broadly and social and cultural impacts. The expansion of what metrics we measure to determine the harm of a plant and therefore its inclusion as a legally managed species has a lot to do with the integration of larger ideas about what a healthy ecosystem is and increased recognition and value placed in ecosystem services. Invasive species have cascading effects through the whole ecosystem. Some natural disasters we are seeing are the result of ecosystems failing to respond to climate due to ecosystem degradation by invasive species. If we take a look at spotted knapweed, for example, it is a highly disturbance adapted uh, plant and it quickly grows from a very small foothold to a full blown invasion. A single plant can produce as many as 140,000 viable seeds every year. These seeds remain viable for many years before germination, um, up to five, five to 10 in the soil is often the quoted number. It produces a chemical in its roots called catechin, and it's actually a herbicide that prevents other plants from competing in the area. Because of this, it actually pushes out other native species, which many birds, invertebrates, and mammals rely on. Soon these other species start to decline as well. This loss of biodiversity leads to less resilient ecosystems. Where invert invasions occur along streams, the type of root that spotted knapweed has leads to increased erosion, which can damage aquatic habitat as well. The picture on the left here is a full field of spotted knapweed. It's really, really taking over um, the rangeland there. I've included a, a number of other environmental implications on the PowerPoint there. If there's any that you have any questions about, please note it, put it in the chat. I'm, uh, I'm going to keep saying that, I think. Um, important part to remember with the environmental implications is that because of the connectivity and the complexity of these ecosystems, what damages one part of the ecosystem will have cascading effects throughout the rest. With a loss of biodiversity, not only do we face potential ecological collapse in the habitat, but humans as part of the natural world also face a great loss. Plants have played an important role in our cultures and our health um, are, are plants that have played an important role are threatened to be lost. We have co-evolved with species that are many that are threatened or choked out. Through this diversity of culture, culturally significant sources of traditional food, medicine, and fiber are threatened. Invasives such as Canadian thistle push people out of areas where we would have previously been able to recreate or exist in. Lakes are choked out by species such as Eurasian milfoil, leading to poor fishing habitat and clogging outboard mo motors. Giant hogweed is an invasive plant found in BC and not yet found in Alberta, but it's quite likely that it could make its way here. It produces a sap that can cause third degree burns and blindness. Similarly, black henbane can cause rashes, uh, skin irritation in some people and is poisonous uh, to ingest. It can lead to impaired vision, convulsions, coma, even death uh, from heart or respiratory failure. Uh, black henbane was originally introduced as a ornamental and medicinal plant and then later escaped cultivation. This is also a great example of a plant with significant economic implications. 
With Kin's ability to grow into rangeland, he reduces viable grazing forager, forage and pasture. While grazers such as cattle have been known to avoid the plant when there's other forage available, they don't really do so when that other forage becomes less available. However, the dried plant components, if it ends up in bales, remain toxic and are readily consumed. And this can lead to large livestock death. According to Environment Canada, the estimated annual cumulative loss uh, of revenue by only 16 invasive species is between 13 and $35 billion. A study published in Nature in March of 2021 used available data sets from around the world, dating from 1970 to 2017, that looked at the economic impacts of biological invasions. And the research suggests that the global economic cost of invasive species has been at least $1.62 trillion over the last 50 years. Some of the most costly species found through the study were mosquitoes, rats, and cats. Not, not the plants that we're talking about today, but I definitely thought that was interesting to talk uh, to bring up. In Canada, the estimated total is $22.8 billion in the last 50 years. And these costs are broken down into two categories, damage and management. 58% of the invasives in Canada are the result of deliberate introductions. Now, we've heard a whole bunch of challenging facts about invasive plants. What is our path forward and what management techniques have been employed? What does the future hold? To prevent introduction, laws and policies, import and export regulations and public awareness is key. Not all invasive plants are listed in provincial or federal weed lists. And individuals really should be cautious purchasing plants from garden centers and outdoor uh, for outdoor planting that have descriptors such as drought tolerant or fast growing. And there are a few basics of invasive plant management here. Number one, prevent introduction. And that's where our laws and policies and learning the uh, native and invasive species in your area can be really, really important. That way you can discern when you go to the, the garden center, which plants to stay away from. Um, we can also begin to prevent invasive plants from reproducing. Um, this will go alongside um, invasive plant removal or management, other management techniques. So you can do seed uh, flower picking to prevent the plants from going to seed. Um, You've probably heard the phrase drain, clean, dry before. Um, it's a catchy slogan to help remember the steps to slow the spread of aquatic invasives. And it's built off that idea of ensuring you're cleaning your tools, equipment, clothing, boots, um, and even your recreational vehicles uh, when you're moving between areas to prevent carrying those invasives with you. Uh, we actually have a boot brush at the weasel head that you can use before and after entering the park to prevent invasive seeds from tagging along on your shoes. Um, it's also important to check um, your pets to see if there are any seeds on their fur. Here's a quick rundown of the management techniques that are used for invasive plants. There are pros and cons to each of these techniques and uh, the techniques that are used are often very species specific. For example, digging up Canadian thistle can actually stimulate its growth. Um, biocontrols are not known for all species and some species do not respond well to chemical treatment. Mechanical removal includes cutting, pulling, smothering, controlled fires, mowing, and girdling. Girdling is a technique where you cut a section of the bark down to um, the inner bark to prevent the plant from properly moving uh, fluids and nutrients through its, um, through its stems and will eventually kill the plant. Biological management techniques includes the use of grazers um, 
introducing predators and insects uh, that will eat the invasive species. This one can be tricky uh, and can lead to the old lady who swallowed a fly type story. Um, I'm not sure if you are all familiar with that, but in that story, an old, an old lady swallowed a fly and then she swallowed a spider to help deal with the fly. And then she swallowed a bird to help deal with the spider and on and on it goes. Uh, chemical treatment includes the use of herbicides. Herbicides can be selective or broad spectrum. They can be contact based or systemic. Now, some application techniques include spraying, cut and stump, hack and squirt, basil bark, all very entertaining names to say. Uh, some plants don't respond to herbicide treatment. It's not necessarily a very accessible method um, as certification is rightly required. And it can have other consequences on the surrounding environment. Integrated techniques employ several methods uh, from the above list. And finally, well, almost finally, by becoming predators ourselves and changing the market valuation of a plant, it can lead to harvesting the overabundant invasive plant. Well, this has been very successful in some areas, you need to be aware of the laws in your area. For example, foraging in the weasel head is prohibited by law, even if you only target invasives. So make sure you are aware of that before you attempt um, any type of control like this. You would also need to ensure you have full comfort and knowledge in foraging, both to prevent dangerous mistakes in identification and to prevent the accidental removal of native species, as there are some invasives that look very, very similar to native species. And another management technique that often goes unrecognized but can play an extremely important role in invasive plant management is in supporting the native species and the natural ecosystem. Shoreline restoration, native species planting, ecosystem engineering to support native species, um, closing off struggling and disturbance affected areas to prevent the introduction and further damage or erosion while an area recovers threatened species mating and release programs, existing on the land respectfully and trying to minimize our impact so that the ecosystem remains healthy, properly disposing of waste, not feeding wildlife, and not using wild bird seed mixes, especially in areas, um, in wild areas, as these usually can contain invasive plant seeds or lead to disease and maladaptive behavioral modification in native bird populations. So restoration of the habitat can go a long way towards preventing a gap or a niche uh, for the invasives to take hold. You can even check out such programs as Clean Drain Dry, Play Clean Go, Buy Local, Burn Local, Don't Let It Loose, and Plant Wise. Uh, and these are all programs that operate in our region and are related to uh, preventing invasive plant spread or managing invasive plants. Now, when a plant is caught or noticed in an area, it plays a very important role in what sort of management techniques will be useful. Early on, if you detect the species before it is established, um, you can potentially um, successfully reach eradication. Later on, you lead towards containment and eventually um, you would hope that it becomes integrated into the environment. And there is evidence of this occurring. Now, often there are species that will uh, peak and then collapse. The dangerous part about this is when that species population peaks, uh, it may be past the point of when the ecosystem it is invading can handle it. While the task of fighting, uh, fighting invasives really does feel like an uphill losing battle, there really is so much that we can do to help. While early detection and invasive plant management, um, intensive management efforts can in some cases lead to eradication, that eradication is the end goal 
can make the task feel a little bit pointless. But there are a couple of very, very important principles to remember here about why our efforts matter. And this is where we jump back to the beginning of the webinar. Ecosystems are built to adapt. Our efforts to slow down the rate of spread and support native species and he healthy ecosystems give those ecosystems a fighting chance. They give them the chance to become familiar and co-evolve with the new species, um, eventually incorporating it into the food web. It gives it a chance for damaged niches to recover in the first place with native species before invasive species take hold. Slowing down the rush of introduced species and the volume of these species will prevent these ecosystems from becoming overwhelmed and crashing before they have a chance to adapt. It is ecosystem collapse that is the largest threat. Where recovery becomes incredibly difficult or impossible as a bank of native species in that instance will no longer exist to repopulate those disturbed areas. So these efforts are important and we can make a very big difference. Um, I've left this list up there. If you want to screenshot it uh, so you can remember, please go for it. Um, we're, we're just very happy to get this information out. I'll give that a moment. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the invasive plants that um, can be found in Calgary area and sometimes are even found in gardens. These are ones to watch out for. Very first, we're going to talk about creeping bellflower. Um, creeping bellflower um, was introduced as an ornamental from Europe. Um, sometimes it's also called creeping bluebell. Um, but I think the, the, the flowers are definitely much more purple to my eye. Uh, they've got thick creeping rhizomes that make the plant very, very aggressive. The rhizomes can even go through concrete and under fences. Um, often you will have to try to find the mother plant in order to eradicate it. It, it is a very difficult plant to eradicate. Uh, what's really entertaining about this one is that the leaves are edible um, and can be cooked as stewed greens. Um, but I do not recommend eating anything unless you are familiar with it, absolutely. Um, especially making sure that you're, you never, never pick from protected wild areas uh, for foraging. Um, invasive plant mechanical removal is another matter. Um, and if you are picking it from your yard, make sure that you did not use herbicides or pesticides. So you definitely do not want to be consuming that. Um, there are a number of plants that you can use instead. Um, you can plant smooth blue beard tongue, tall lungwort, um, wild bergamot, and silver eight perennial lupine. Um, one plant can produce thousands of seeds per year, and these seeds are very, very small and therefore hard to keep track of. So they can spread um, very easily. All right, on to our next one. Purple loosestrife, it is a very gorgeous plant, but it is on the prohibited noxious weed list. It's originally native to Europe, Asia, and Africa, and again, was introduced intentionally as an ornamental plant. It poses a huge threat to riparian and wetland habitat. It has short rhizomes and a taproot. The leaves clasp I don't know if you can see in the, the picture there, the leaves clasp around the stem and have smooth margins. So the outside of the leaf has no indents. Um, the flowers are clustered on this vertical terminal spike, which can be quite long and very strong. Um, and the flowers are this purplish color uh, with four to eight petals. Uh, the seeds uh, are again tiny small brown seeds and they can remain viable for up to 20 years a single mature plant can produce up to 2.5 million seeds for control of purple loosestrife uh, people will often hand pick or 
do chemical or herbicide application. Um, instead of planting purple loose strife, you could plant tall larkspur or meadow blazing star. And I've tried to pick um, native species to recommend here instead. Um, finding native species nurseries or, or plant garden stores can be a bit difficult. I will share some resources for that towards the end here. Yellow clematis is another uh, weed that's on the noxious weed list here in Alberta. Um, it's native to Asia and introduced and sold again as an ornamental. Um, it's very often found in urban areas. You can see it growing on the fence here, absolutely overtaking it. Um, it's got a creeping root and it will often wrap around other species, essentially strangling them. Uh, the leaf tips are very pointed and the edges are coarsely toothed. Um, the leaves might be slightly hairy on the underside. The stems are branched and uh, leaves will grow on both the new and old woodyish stems. The flowers are yellow, they have four petals, they're bell-shaped and they'll face downwards, usually. Um, the seeds are these big puffs you can kind of see here in the middle of the picture. Um, which very easily move on the wind. They catch the wind and blow away. For dealing with yellow clematis, uh, you can hand pull it and people do use uh, chemical application herbicides. Uh, instead, you can plant a native clematis, the western white clematis or, or common hop. Um, what's interesting about yellow clematis is because it does dry out and become this very sort of flammable material creeping across a number of other plants, it can lead to an increased fire hazard. So it has an extra danger um, in that. A little bit about oxeye daisy. This one might be very familiar. It's from the sunflower family. Um, I know there were tons growing in the alleyway um, growing up and I would make daisy chains, the whole thing. Um, and now I don't feel bad about pulling those those plants up. <laughs> um, it is on the noxious weed list as well. Um, it was introduced intentionally from Europe as an ornamental um, and is still sometimes sold even though it's on the noxious weed list. Um, it is a short-lived perennial. Its roots are very shallow and uh, have branching rhizomes. The leaves are pretty variable. Um, they can be very thin sometimes and deeply deeply toothed, um, where sometimes they end up a bit wider and rounder towards the end um, and less toothed. So identification by the leaves can be a bit challenging. Um, the flower itself is a two to five centimeter diameter flower. Um, and it's got the white, uh, white outer petals, um, the florets, and the yellow center, the disc florets. Um, it actually has a bit of an unpleasant odor, so you could use that to help you with identification. Um, the seeds are tiny, small, black uh, with ribbed uh, seeds. Uh, for control, a um, herbicide application is used. You can deadhead them. That's when you pick off the flower, uh, the flowers so they don't go to seed. Um, and you can, again, try to plant some other plants, uh, native plants instead, such as alpine aster, tufted fleabane, and showy fleabane, to name a couple. Now, this brings us to the targets of the Weaselhead Glemmer Parks invasive plant uh, program. Their main target is spotted knapweed, which is on the prohibited noxious weed list. Um, it was introduced from uh, Europe and it covers vast areas of land now. Um, it is pretty well adapted to disturbed habitats and moves into them very quickly um, and can survive in both moist and dry habitats, rangeland and beside waterways. It does prefer well-drained soils though and it's not very tolerant of constant moisture. Um, a single plant can produce over 140,000 seeds in a year. Um, it is a biennial 
most often with a first year rosette and then in the second year a flowering bolt. Um, but some, in some cases it will um, be a short lived perennial instead and flower every year. It is able to self pollinate as well, which makes the dangers uh, or the challenges of managing this plant even more difficult. Um, the wild thing, I mentioned this earlier, it does produce a herbicide in its roots. This herbicide would be toxic to spotted knapweed as well, but the roots have evolved a mechanism so that once it is released from the roots into the surrounding soils, it is not reuptaken by the spotted knapweed roots. Um, to manage spotted knapweed, and part of what we are doing, um, you can hand pick in the rosette stage, um, you can dig up the mature plants and um, herbicide application can be used. Uh, we are not using that in the weasel head. With the spotted knapweed removal, what is really, really important is that you bring the removed plants, the dug up plants out of the area that you um, dug them up. The reason why is because these flowers will still go to seed if you have dug up the plant and set it outside. So um, you can actually speed up that seed production stage by doing that. So if you do any spotted knapweed removal, you can deadhead it, take off the, the flowers and beg them for removal. Um, or if you're digging up the whole plant, making sure that you again are very carefully bagging the plant up for removal and disposing of that properly in um, invasive plant bins. The city of Calgary actually has a number of dedicated um, weed bins. Uh, you can find that on the city of Calgary website. So if you find any of these invasives in your garden um, or if you get involved in any invasive plant removal um, outside, of, outside of your own yard, um, then making sure you're disposing of them properly. These plants and viable plant material should never go in compost. All right, let's jump to our next one. I don't know how time is going so fast. Oh, here's a, a little bit more about uh, a few more pictures to help you identify spotted knapweed. Now to our next plant, here we are. Tony Aster. Um, so here we actually have two species that we are talking about, um, including shiny Catoni Aster and uh, Peking Catoni Aster. Um, in the weasel head, we use mechanical removal techniques. We dig them up. Catoni Aster is not listed on the provincial uh, or federal uh, controlled weed lists. It is a not, not considered a noxious weed. Um, it is still often sold and you'll see it once you begin to recognize it, you will see it absolutely everywhere. It's a very, very common landscaping plant. The seeds are very widely distributed by uh, fruit eating birds, frugivores, and their process of eating it makes the seeds um, or assists the seeds in germination. So a lot of these seeds actually have to go through um, either a deep cold or a scarification or damaging process uh, that indicates to the seed that it's time to germinate. If you see a, a wild thicket of invasive cotoneasters, you'll see just how much um, land it can take up. It begins to push out other species in the area. Um, and I think it personally, I believe it's only a matter of time before this becomes a controlled plant as well. And I will move on to the last main target of our invasive plant program, and that is Tatarian honeysuckle. Um, again, this is another one you'll, you've probably seen in yards. It's often used in landscaping. My use of the, the name Tatarian honeysuckle is a bit of a misnomer. There's a couple of different uh, um, invasive honeysuckle plants. Um, that have all kind of been categorized together and they have fairly similar features, but this is one you do want to be careful in identifying as when they're small, 
there are uh, a number of native species that can be confused with them. Now, Tatarian honeysuckle itself is a multi-stemmed perennial. Um, if you are looking to identify it, a, a key feature I, I recommend kind of from a distance identifying is looking for that gray, gnarly, shaggy bark. It peels off in vertical strips. Um, and if you're up close beside the plant, you can, uh, if it's an old enough plant, um, you can break a branch and see if the center of that branch is hollow, and that's the pit. Again, this honeysuckle or this woody invasive takes over uh, extensive areas and prevents um, any plants from growing in the area, often creating really thick um, cover. So the ground, uh, ground cover ends up being lost from that um, extensive shading. All right, now a little bit about the invasive plant program at the Weasel Head. Uh, our current main targets, as I mentioned, are spotted knapweed, Tony Aster, and Tartarian honeysuckle. We use um, GIS and mapping to help target and follow our targets throughout, um, throughout, throughout our program since 2009 when we first began uh, controlling the spread of invasive plants. The picture you see up there right now is um, of the main uh, targeted regions for spotted knapweed. A number of these regions have actually been completely successful in eradication. Uh, just this year, the area labeled G and B are now totally, totally free of spotted knapweed. Um, additionally, the regions F, E, and A, way over here, are now underwater with the uh, development, the improvement of the dam, the Glenmore Reservoir Dam, raising the water levels. So those areas are not viable anymore for spotted knapweed. As we learned earlier, it is intolerant of consistently moist habitats. So those gravel beds are no longer useful open habitat for the spotted knapweed to invade. However, we are still conducting a lot of work on these polygons, these regions towards the west of the park. Um, we began this program, as I mentioned, in 2009, and it first targeted um, a number of different invasives, although the spotted knapweed uh, was spotted in the weasel head first in 2015. And it's speculated that the species established following the 2013 floods where it might have been brought downstream. Um, following the initial discovery, we found and identified these, um, these target areas within the weasel head and began our removal of the spotted knapweed. Um, the species that we target are known to impact ecosystem function and reduce biodiversity. And the program promotes the care of riparian areas and we're working to uh, assist uh, people getting experiences out there in stewardship so that uh, it may pre uh, um, the value of that land may be appreciated and people can actively engage in, stu engage in stewardship of their parks, their city parks. Um, let me go to our next one. And we've had some very excellent success since 2009. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about what we did in 2022. Um, we removed a total of 1,080 woody plants. And yes, we count every time we go out uh, to remove the plants. Uh, we bring various groups out with us, uh, whether it's um, corporate groups that are doing um, a volunteer day all together or team building. Uh, school groups have come out with us and we do individual um, uh, weeding workshops where volunteers can all come and join uh, together as individuals um, and assist us in this project. We've removed 826 Catoni Aster plants, 254 Tatarian honeysuckle, 
and 172 pounds of spotted knapweed. We hosted 21 workshops, 141 volunteers joined us, and it culminated in a total of 520 volunteer hours. So we had a, a very busy, very successful year. Um, what I want to note as being particularly interesting is that although the number of volunteer hours and participation has remained re relatively steady and increasing in, in many years and uh, currently, um, the amount of spotted knapweed, the weight has gone down. So this is a potential indication that the plants are getting smaller. We may be removing more rosettes now. Um, and the plants may be harder to find or farther apart. So it may take a bit more time to remove. The tricky part with this is that although we are starting to see that success, we have to keep that pressure on, um, especially as those seeds can remain viable in the soil for five to 10 years. Um, and so returning to those areas will be an important part of this work.